Namaskar. Hello and welcome to Peak Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. I hope you have been watching some of the videos that we have been putting out. We've been rather busy. Yesterday there was a town hall meeting of Congressman Ro Khanna who happens to represent the Fremont district and this is the same uh, district from where the state senator Aisha Wahab has been trying to pilot the SB403. Find out all about it, what happened, what kind of answers were given, what kind of questions were asked. All this available to you. This link is, uh, we are going to put the link in the description section so you can easily access it from this video itself. Right now, let's uh, welcome our co-host Sridhar Chityalaji. Sridhar Ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar, good morning. Good morning and Namaskar to everybody. Sridhar Ji, I have to tell you this before we go into the program. There are so many slips between the cup and the lip when you are covering something from the ground. It's just maddening. So I, I'll just leave it at that. Let's move on to today's news, sir. First off, uh, IMF has given a very slow growth for the world in the next 12 months. Talk to us a little bit about it, the rise of Bitcoin, why that is happening, and a few other things that's happening while Finance Minister is in United States, that is your forte, sir. Take it away. Uh, first and foremost, I think the, um, they clearly see headwinds um, and inflation continues to pose a challenge, notwithstanding the fact that we saw some at least positive threads as we come into the show on the U.S. Uh, inflation numbers, which reverberated in the rest of the world. So the growth, um, they, had, uh, they expect growth from both in 2023 and 2024 to be tepid. So they have now cut the forecast for both 2023 and 2024. 2023, they just cut by uh, 10 basis points. And uh, so from 2.9 to 2.8. But far more uh, important is the 3% that, uh, that they're forecasting for uh, 2024. So the world has to be cognizant. And the only game in town uh, is going to be uh, you know, countries such as India, which is uh, going to drive and add to the aggregate GDP of the world. The aggregate GDP today is around $90 trillion. So that's on the IMF um, discussions that are going on. The second question, the second thing that you pointed out is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is uh, quite astonishing that the finance minister is in, uh, when I use the word astonishing, there's more, more than 300 delegates attending uh, the event which where she was addressing the various members. Uh, remember that uh, India is the chair of the G20 um, and the G20 finance ministers were also at the meeting. It's an integrated session of World Bank, IMF, uh, as well as the, the G20 finance ministers. Uh, I think she was very articulate in laying out uh, what India has done and what India plans to do to mitigate all the challenges uh, that are ahead which prompted IMF to say that India is the big game in town as far as the global growth is concerned. So it's, I think, very positive uh, momentum. But the most important thing that I want to say is that this is very significant that an Indian finance minister, as a chair of the G20, addressing and about 300 delegates ranging from CEOs and finance ministers attending the meet in Washington, D.C. Yes, indeed. And and back to my uh, town hall meeting. You should look at the whole thing, viewers, because lots of tough questions were asked. And, you know, politician being a politician, Congressman Rokhana kind of said sidestepped them and answered many questions also. So you need to understand how these things ebb and flow and, and to understand how the politicians in, in D.C. are thinking. From what tweet, uh, Kanna tweets to what he responds in person, there's a slight difference. I would like you to watch it till the end to understand that. Sir, Bitcoin, 30,000 crossed again, and they are saying it will cross 100,000 by the end of next year. This is one prediction. They are even saying that one of the very bullish people said that it might even cross 1 million in five years' time. Sridharji, 100,000, I think I see it happening, maybe. But uh, again, the shallowness, sir, it's not really widespread. Well, I think the uh, we have covered this topic and we received a lot of adverse criticism. And in fact, many pundits uh, in social media channels said, well, you know, Bitcoin is going to go away. And we have said this consistently that it will remain. The prices will gyrate. Uh, that's just fact of life. And we have also laid out the case that 3% of the global assets at peak, it can go to 5%. Anything between 2 to 5% will be 
allocated to alternate assets when there are you know headwinds and when there are issues around um, you know either the interest rates climbing currency rate issues etc so uh, under the present circumstances whenever there is an issue around economic growth challenges around the dollar challenges around the growth the money naturally shifts to bitcoin so therefore this is one of the drivers um and bitcoin crypto is part of the kind of the commodities you see the gold price rising you see potentially the energy price being risen under the contrived mechanisms of opec plus so you will also see uh, bitcoin as an alternate asset class being allocated capital whenever there is strife in the market srigi and we have said this before we say this again we continue to say the same thing uh, thank you sir and viewers please like this video because we have a lot of india centric news today a lot happening in that part of the world as well as what is happening in the far east so we are going to give you a lot of information could really help if you can like this video we, we need a few more likes to get the the youtube viral engine to go crazy i would like it to go crazy uh, sridhar ji Arunachal Pradesh. Amit Shah flew down to Arunachal, and he said that we will not allow even one one inch of space to be occupied. Now we are also hearing that India is getting real time intelligence data from the United States, so that in case there is something brewing in the Chinese kitchen about ambushing, India will have adequate time to prepare. That was proven last year in December two thousand and twenty two when India got the right intel, and they were really. uh they pounded the heck out of the chinese troops very little is being told about it but long story short sridhar ji india is getting a lot of help from us on this and both sides are playing it down why sir well i think that the um anything which is to do with the defense anything which is to do with strategic information which are sensitive from a military intelligence point of view uh, i think they will use it for the right purpose there's nothing to do chest thumping and publicizing to the world it also puts probably um, india in a disadvantages or from a negotiating position point of view so they want to receive the information on a as needed basis and act on it by the way we also covered in dgi and indicated the matrix group providing information on coco islands where the chinese workers were seen working uh with the with the connivance of the of the the Myanmar uh government and building radar and surveillance center that data was presented to the Myanmar government as uh, provided by the United States with the satellite images and uh, you know the Myanmar government denied the fact that all this information is known you know does put some element of deterrence on china that india is just not keeping quiet it is well prepared uh and it has its uh, allies in right places to provide the strategic input to tackle the chinese and um you know with rising crude prices will that impact india's growth see i'm hearing projections inside india from 6.1 to 6.3 outside i think world bank has predicted india will grow at 5.9% i mean more or less in the same ballpark um the question i have for you sridhar ji is when do you think crude price Uh, rise will hit india and the inflation will go up or is it already uh, corrected now the india's inflation is been well controlled and is being seems to be well managed uh pr- predominantly because it has been able to get discounted oil prices at substantive discounted discounted oil prices from the russians we showed the data in you know few uh, days ago how the russian supplies has dwindled from 44% to 4% which is a strategic kind of from its strategic buyer which is europe so they really need to find a venue even if it is discounted uh, to get the cash coming in not only to keep the economy going but the war machine going i mean all is not going with war they need money so india has been very successfully successfully negotiating and buying by the way japan has also been allowed to buy uh, the oil from the russians as long as they don't use the ecosystem uh, where the sanctions apply so 
I feel that they will continue to cushion. They probably may be asked and allowed to buy even from Iran. They may use other nations, including UAE, who is a strategic supplier. So the question to me is right now, it, they seem to be managing on this 60% or 30% or 35% discount on a price band between 70 to $84 uh, a barrel. They also are getting this um, specific category of oil, which they're able to refine and also export and reduce the price in the process. What happens if this price goes past $100 or $110? Then I don't think India is going to be able to escape the inflation uh, arising from this high price. Nobody expects it's likely to be right now. The futures are around $85 to $88. They are not yet nearing the $100, but it could happen. Sridharji, not much is being talked about the fact that India is getting crude and then refining it and exporting it back to European countries. This could not be happening without the United States saying yes, because US cannot pick up the slack or the demand when it says that it will supply all the oil and natural gas to the West, and that is to Europe. This, this is this, uh, you know, uh, how how much is this in terms of quantum, sir? Is that a growth prospect for India? Because I think India is the largest refinery in the world today. Well, I think that it is certainly a growth prospect. Uh, we don't have enough data that is available to substantiate what is the percentage um, that is being domestically consumed and what is the percentage that is being shipped. Clearly, the arrangement with United States and you are beginning to see whether some of the oil that is Remember, United States has occupied, we pointed that out to US today is the largest supplier of crude uh, to Europe. We showed the chart less than 12 months from February 2022 to today. They have moved up to close to 28 percent of the Europe supplies is being met by United States. Is some per part of that is going from India through uh, from sorry United States to India to Europe? Don't know. But clearly, um, there is there is this games at play, uh, whether it is being, uh, we don't have, I don't have data to point out, but we'll certainly investigate and let people know. And India's mobile exports double and much is being attributed to the success of the PLI program. You've been talking about the PLI program as one of the most successful initiatives of the Modi government for a long time now. Sridharji will touch upon that. Sridharji, Apple, iPhone and Samsung exports are contributing close to $4 billion of U.S. exports. That's an impressive number. It is. I think they have uh, quadrupled the number uh, from $1 billion uh, to about, uh, you know, uh, uh, pentaplied $5 billion. Now, exports is about $10 billion. The $10 billion, you know, as you rightly pointed out, Apple and Samsung is making about uh, $3.6 to $4 billion of that. So, India has clearly, you know, arrived as far as the mobile phones is concerned. It's the largest, one of the largest, second largest consumer, but it could very soon become one of the, the largest exporters if the present trend continues. Clearly, Apple has evinced an indicated interest to move a good part of the manufacturing, both for domestic consumption, fearing some of the sanctions that could hit China, as well as... Um, having augmentative capacity. So I think you will see India playing a big role. And all this is going to help, uh, you know, to mitigate to some extent uh, the economic headwinds that the world is facing. Also, viewers, we should keep in mind that if Apple starts manufacturing in India, Samsung starts manufacturing in India, India doesn't have the wherewithal to provide all the raw materials to make an, a cell phone. So India has to import from who else? China the raw material. So that means India's imports will go up at least in the short term until India is able to indigenize all the imports and start producing it itself so that first of all, the price will go down of the iPhone and the Samsung phone. Second of all, it's the generation of jobs inside India itself. This takes time. I am wondering how much of the component of the import bill is because India needs to, is trying to rise as a manufacturing hub for uh, things like mobile phones. So this is a number game. I think Sridharji and I will work on something and we'll come back to you because we shouldn't keep on looking at everything and saying this is bad, that is bad. There are, there are reasons why 
the import bill from China is probably going up. Sridharji, your thought before we go to the next topic, sir. Well, I think that is very true. Uh, the import substitution is going on. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but some of the other, some of the imports continue. As far as the rising uh, exports, especially around the manufacturing, uh, there are drivers that will contribute towards the import side until substitution occurs. But some of these may also be what you call correlatory effects, because some of these spare parts may be coming from Samsung as well as um, Apple, who in turn are importing this from uh, the Chinese, uh, because their supply chain is not fully decoupled uh, from China as yet. It may in, in due course, but not yet. All of this does contribute, as you rightly point out, Sriji, towards the rising import bill. Yes, sir. And now let's take a quick look at something else. India dismisses reports of suspending free trade agreement talks with UK over Sikh extremism. Ukraine's deputy foreign minister on Monday said Kiev wanted New Delhi to be more involved in helping resolve its conflict with Russia. She's also sought a visit by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and other top officials. Please take it away, sir. Well, I think that it just again uh, shows that, uh, you know, who is the most trusted player in the world right now? Uh, clearly, India is emerging as one of the most trusted players. And uh, the thought was not lost on them uh, to visit India by the, uh, the, by the Deputy Minister. She has uh, made three specific requests. One, for Modi ji to visit, Indian Prime Minister to visit Ukraine. Second, whether Zelensky can be invited uh, to address the G20 meet because India is the chair. And the third, she said that many of our infrastructure around the oil refineries are damaged and India has the wherewithal to come and be supportive to see whether some of those things can be fixed. Remember, India also um, imports uh, some fertilizers and inert gases from Ukraine. So this is all positive and shows and demonstrates India's leadership as a trusted leader and arbitrator. Sridharji, I also noticed that uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister is pretty dharmic. She talked about being at an ashram in India. She actually quoted from scriptures. Um, some of them so sounded like she must be watching DGI even because there were some you know, sound bites that looked very similar to what we have used in the past. Well, I think that that'll be good if she has used the sound bites. But I think I've men we have mentioned this before. There's a significant uh, number of Ukrainians uh, who follow the, um, the Sri Krishna movement. And a lot of them even have uh, names such as Radha. Um, and so there is, there is a considerable element of uh, the Dharmic aspect within Ukraine. So it's natural uh, that some of this flows through when these people come. Why they didn't come before and why they're coming now? Because they probably went astray and they feel that, okay, you know, let's come and talk to India because it would probably make sense. And India is also has the trust of the Russians, uh, much more than uh, much more than I would say the Chinese, because India is much has a long, long association with the Russians. That probably what prompted her to come and say, okay, you know, can we do something about it? Yes, indeed. And uh, U.S. and um, U.S. is now doing war games with Philippines. We have a, uh, a picture for you, a graphic for you. Sridharji will explain to us what is going on. Sridharji, go ahead, sir. Yes. Four new bases, uh, if you recall, we co covered this in, uh, in again, you know, a couple of days ago. But we just wanted to point the picture. So there is the uh, Kimio Oasis basis in what we call as the Kagayan region. There's two bases there in the, the, um, the Lalo airport. And then there's also at the Isabella, uh, which is further, a little further south. Now, why, it is, why these three new bases are important? These three new bases are important because they, are, they face Taiwan. They're only about less than 400, especially the, uh, the Camillo Oasis bases is less than OCS basis is less than 400 kilometers. Notwithstanding the fact Mr. Marcos has stated that no offensive position stands will be taken, but it does give United States a very strong foothold should things happen in, in, in Taiwan. Now coming to the, the fourth one, which is new, if you remember the Palawan uh, region that was visited by, uh, by the Vice President of United States, Kamala Harris, uh, she flew and met with some of the people uh, in the island. 
and then uh, she flew out. This is again very close to Sprotly Islands, which is contested by Philippines and China in the South China Sea. It's called as the Balabak Island uh, base. And that gives access to United States in terms of keeping a track as to what is happening in South China Sea. These are new locations. This was renegotiated or negotiated, which was kept pending from the previous regime. And Marcos has signed, uh, is very, very strategic. And they've recently conducted uh, drills using all the 10 bases in Philippines. This is US Philippines. Um, Sridharji, I see a certain amount of, uh, you know, dialing down by China over its saber rattling as well as, you know, now it's beginning to talk to South Asian nations, ASEAN nations saying, you know, you know, talk less and, and less rhetoric and so on. I see a slight shift in stance of China. I'm wondering if China now realizes that it may never get back to the growth path it had previous to the COVID incident. I'm just guessing here, but viewers, you should watch Elmer Yuan's uh, video conversation with me. That will air uh, about an hour from now. Do watch it because there is something else happening inside China. That's what Elmer feels. And we are going to give you that video shortly. Sridharji, do you sense that, sir? Because even today's news, I see that now suddenly China is playing a slightly different tune. China has four major issues. Um, I let Mr. Elman, Elmer Yuen cover from his perspective, from at least from the perspective of uh, some of the people that I speak with. There are four major, four major issues that China is facing inside. They have not fully recovered from COVID. So there is still economic catastrophe within China, is number one. Number two, they have got very heavy losses because of impaired credit, which is affecting their industry. That is number two. Number three, which is even equally important, that they have faced the backlash of the sanctions. And so the economy, there's no consumption domestically, plus the exports are slowing down. So this is also creating an economic catastrophe. Fourth, many of these nations, with many of the ASEAN nations and other nations, with the saber rattling that China has been engaged in, especially after Emperor Xi took over the full power, they are beginning to get a lot of pushback, which is to say that should this war break out, it is nothing but it is going to be catastrophic for the Chinese is concerned. So all this feedback is going back uh, into Mr. Xi Jinping. He has also met with the CEOs and various leaders, most recently, including from United States. And the shift of Apple is a very significant issue for him from China to India. It's a very big issue and, for him. And, and this is one of the aspects that Elmer deals with at length. For example, the real estate uh, cost contributing between 30 to 35 percent of China's GDP. Guess where it is today? Find out these uh, these data by watching Elmer Yuan's video. He's basically echoing what Sridharji is saying, except that we are taking a couple more steps into the whole problem because it'll, then it will give you an idea when, if any, China will be able to come out of it. So just do watch that program. I know I'm kind of pitching the other program because the thing is, we are giving you one extended narrative of various things that's happening, bringing in experts, being on the ground. So I just want you to understand that we, as a, as a uh, responsible YouTube blogger, we want to give you everything with different perspectives sometimes. Not every expert that comes on our channel may agree with what the previous expert said, but that's the whole idea. That's the idea is to educate you. So you understand that, okay, there are two sides to this story. And let me see which is right and which is wrong. So that is the idea here. Thank you so much, Sridharji. And now let's take a look at uh, Russia's claims over Bakhmut. They say that they have occupied 75% of Bakhmut. I think you, Ukraine begs to differ. I mean, there is no clear-cut victory or loss at this point of time as I see it, sir. This is becoming a battle of uh, attrition, in my opinion. Um, the uh, private force that Russia was using called Wagner is, is the one that is heading this Bakhmut thing, I'm, I'm told. Kind of walk us through what is happening, why this Bakhmut is so important for both sides. Uh, it's very important within the context of uh, taking over the East. Uh, you know, so the Eastern Front, the, the Donetsk and the Luhansk region, this Bakhmut battle 
is very critical. And if they win this battle, then it's just a straight walkthrough as far as the eastern region is concerned. And then that will, from there, they will flow through into Crimea. So there are two major fronts that Ukraine, uh, two major offensive uh, that uh, Ukraine is uh, contemplating to launch. Uh, one is in Crimea, which uh, Russia says it is prepared. And second is the entrenched battle that is taking place and supply lines are disrupted. The Russian supply lines are disrupted to Bakhmut region, which is what Wagner Group has pointed out. And there's also tensions between uh, the, the Russian generals as well as this private army, which is all slowing down. And any slowing down implies cost, cost, cost. And if Russia doesn't play this private army, they're not going to fight. So this is another issue uh, that uh, the Wagner Group has pointed out, which is namely uh, their their uh, their payments. So all this is bogging them down, and uh, it remains to be seen as to whether the uh, the major offensive that Ukraine is contemplating will bring about a decisive victory in Bakhmut and in the process thwart the Russian move into the eastern region. Sridharji. Talk to us a little bit about the probe of the leak of sensitive documents from the United States on the Ukraine war plans. Why does this concern countries like Australia, sir? It concerns because the reason is the we, uh, there's a lot of information that has to come out. And much of that information has is slowly trickling out. For example, apparently CIA has been monitoring the dialogue that's taking place within Korea, uh, especially the leadership. And that information was leaked out. Apparently, Egypt is a big ally of, uh, of, uh, of uh, United States. That Egypt has got factories building arms for um, feeding the Russians. That's number two. Number three, even UAE is somehow entangled with Russia. And so, therefore, that information has come out. And fourth, uh, which is far more how exactly NATO... And United States will feed into uh, into the supply lines as well as the battle plans, which means all the the allies within United well, allies of United States within NATO are also impacted if all these data is coming out of papers from United States Defense Department. So who is behind it? You can guess, and your guess is as good as mine. And at the most sensitive time. This only We have only seen initial bits. There's apparently more to come. Yes, indeed. And viewers, there is something strange about this whole thing. You know, uh, for the longest time when the Republicans were in power, they were talking about how the vice president of United States was actually the CEO of Halliburton Energy, which was a big supplier of energy equipment, drilling, what have you. They also happened to have a private army fit who got a lot of contracts when he was a vice president when U.S. was in Iraq. Now, look at who is the defense secretary. What was he before that? He was on the board of Raytheon, one of the biggest military manufacturers for U.S. And guess what happened? He comes on board and then there is this Ukraine war. Who is manufacturing over time? In the uh, United States. They are, you know, the, the factories that are doing all these weapons armaments is at, at full tilt right now. So what I'm trying to say is it doesn't seem to matter whether it is the Democrats or the Republicans. There are vested interests. These vested interests will give you some small crumbs of bread and then they extract multifold. My, re my read on this situation, Sridharji, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that the, uh, there's no doubt about uh, whenever there is a war, uh, the war machinery and the industry benefits. But I have a feeling we'll, we'll probably, you know, in a few DGIs, we will probably uncover more and report. But there's, there's something more than meets the eye as far as the Russia-Ukraine is concerned. Besides, the, we covered one part of it. The energy group uh, that is within Ukraine has the Lithuanian uh prime minister and as well as mr hunter biden involved in that specific group uh there's been stories around the uh, bio labs in ukraine and there's also been why this whole region was quiet and uh, during the trump years and biden comes over and you have all kinds of issues flare up especially around 
uh, NATO getting active and unnecessarily dragging Russia into this into this war and disrupting uh, and creating a problem not only to Europe but to the rest of the world. Uh, so there's more than meets the eye. We are just we are just picking up because we just want to be very careful as to what kind of information we present before the before you all. Uh, and once we have done enough research, we can give some of the insights as to what is driving this war very clearly that it is not just occupation of territory. Now, there's also some interesting things happening outside of this, which was the Supreme Court's decision to overturn more or less Roe v. Roe v. Wade. And this is now, you know, being fought out in every state legislature. Sridharji, talk to us a little bit about what is happening in Texas, the judges ruling and, and how it affects uh, people. Sir. My, uh, you know, let, let's set, my, set aside my opinion on this. Talk to us. What is happening, sir? Basically, Texas have banned or temporarily suspended uh, sale of the CDC approved um, anti-abortion pill. That in turn, um, you know, has triggered uh, a whole uh, uh, slew of issues and brought all the Democrats to come together and say, we'll fight the election. How can you how can you ban or how can you even suspend temporarily, uh, you know, without rhyme or rhythm? Uh, because uh, you believe in one version of the world as opposed to taking precedence from the Supreme Court decision. Supreme Court did not ban. Supreme Court basically effectively stated that the choice is left with the states as to how they will implement the decision rather than mandating it as a Supreme Court directive to all the states. Each state may follow its own principle. And uh, so that is what the Supreme Court decision was. So you have all the democratic states lining up and basically saying, you know, we'll fly people, we will increase the supply of the abortion pills. Even if Texas decides to permanently ban, you can come over to the states. So this is very much, uh, you know, we are back to pro-life, pro-choice battle. Uh, Texas believes in one way. There are some of the other states believe in the other way. So let us see how this plays out, Sriji. But it is purely a, uh, what you call as a religi religious philosophical bat battle between one, one set of people and the other set of people. Thank you very much, sir. And now, if you don't mind, let's take a few questions, Sridharji. Maybe if you could limit your answers to one minute per answer, that will be great. Because we, I'd like to take four or five questions. Let's start the questions, please. Rahul Rathod wants to know, by 2030, can China overtake US in GDP and by when India could achieve 5 trillion GDP? Why India is unable to achieve targeted 25% GDP <coughs> in the manufacturing sector even after PLI schemes? Um, China will overtake uh, US, I think by 2027, 2028, uh, China will overtake. This is nominal GDP. Uh, as far as PPP is concerned, China is already uh, ahead of United States. As far as the Indian GDP is 5 trillion is concerned, it is very much around that 26, 27 trajectory. It would have got by 26, but for uh, the contraction that took place during COVID. And, and then, of course, it recovered out of the COVID. As far as the achieve the target of 25% of, I don't know, I think India manufacturing is close to 30 to 34% of GDP. It's not 25% of GDP. Uh, you know, it's like 50, 50 to 55 percent comes from services sector, close to about 14 percent, uh, 14 to 15 percent comes from the agricultural sector. Rest of it is manufacturing. The growth uh, trajectory uh, will improve, but much of it uh, takes about three to five years. These PLI programs don't kind of kick in and you don't have uh, improvement from day it's one. It's not a switch. It's not a switch. It takes about three to five years and you will find the manufacturing uh, sector grow uh, because of the PLI, uh, PLI programs. And also the shift takes place in slow phases. Uh, obviously, mobile is one. Defense manufacturing is one. Pharmaceutical is one. Refining is one. You have seen consumer electronics industries is another segment. Uh, that you have seen like, you know, air conditioners and refrigerators, etc., moving back to, I mean, light bulbs moving back into India. So you will see growth coming over the next three to four years. 
Sridhar ji, I saw a comment in one of the videos and this is a gentleman who lives in deep south in a place called Mailadudurai. It is one of those less used railway lines and he said that there is constant traffic of goods trains going from north to Cochin from where a lot of grains are getting exported. Nobody has mentioned anything about this, but this is the information we are getting from the ground. India is starting to export grains in a big way. Uh, and again, the uh, the harvest is expected to be fine. The rain for this year is supposed to be no normal. So a lot of other things are also happening. Anything and everything is going to help to that $5 trillion mark. Who knows if, the, if there's a commodities price shortage that can be attained even faster. So all I'm trying to say is there are lots of things happening. Now let's go on to the next question, please. Oh, how's it going? When do you think India's Sensex will get decoupled from Nasdaq or Dow Jones? Well, Sensex, uh, to my, in my humble view, Sensex is decoupled from uh, Nasdaq or Dow Jones. But what are Dow Jones? Sentiments play a part. The sentiments are global because a good chunk of uh, money comes from overseas markets. Um, I think Sensex is very much driven by what is happening within the domestic markets. The US markets, I mean, the Indian markets have done relatively better compared to uh, to Dow Jones. You know, um, how's it going? You have to understand that the SEBI organization is totally incompetent. They have given a clean check to Times of India about whom we have written tomes about how they have evaded taxes. They've done a whole bunch of other stuff. You look at all the media companies, NDTV, slap on the wrist, if that. Uh, Bloomberg Quint, again, go, go, go. Uh, and now Times of India gets a clean check. Is Adani going to be acquiring Times of India? I don't know. But what I see is these are all things where, you know, some of the regulators are not doing their job. Next, sir. Partha P. Do you see an expanse of currencies in the IMF special drawing rights as a transition to accommodate the rise of the Asian Monetary Fund? <sighs> You know, when I look at the currencies within, uh, you know, the global currencies, you know, the G7 countries make up about 97, 95%. 2% may, is China and about 3.5% is rest of the world. On the SDR, special drawing rights, you, you, you know, I think that the... Um, um, they, they may not they may not alter the course, but if any willing nation is prepared to step up, then they will be willing to kind of accommodate. That is within the constitutional structure of IMF and World Bank. For example, until recently, China was actually drawing uh, and deriving benefit and calling itself as a developing nation. Until China was told, I'm sorry, you are the second largest economy. You are not a developing nation. You should not be drawing funds from here for your projects. You have enough money in your bank account to do it. So I think they will accommodate or they will allow. But there is a very finely defined structure. I think today there is about $960 billion of SDR, uh, which they have been deploying. For example, Sri Lanka is a beneficiary. Some of the African nations are a beneficiary. The capital got uh, allocated. Uh, so I, I think that the, you know, we have been speaking of the rising rise of the Asian Monetary Fund. But one has to ask the question, how much of it has flown in the last few years in developing? If Asia Monetary Fund exists, why did you start some China or BRICS Development Bank? Why did you stop all these other institutions conflicting with some. So Asia has to get its act together, which route it wants to choose. Already within ASEAN, there's a very well-developed mechanism. Uh, there's also well-developed mechanism that I that they can use IMF to draw. Um, the Asia Development Bank, which is augmentative to World Bank and IMF, has also been providing support to some of the Asian nations. So it's all operating within an existing umbrella. And um, uh, there's nothing that IMF needs to do to change its course unless somebody presents something interesting. Uh, last question, please. Jagannath Das wants to know, what is the new CNG plan government introduced to whom it will be helpful? They say it will get 10% price. 
I don't I don't have uh, I don't have an answer to this question, Shiji, unless uh, you have. Yeah, you have. I, I'll, 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 I'll give a quick uh, answer to that. Jagannath, what is happening is now cities like Chennai are going to get gas on like a pipe, just like a water you get on a pipe. You're going to get gas on a pipe. Now, this reduces distribution costs. It also reduces, you know, the LNG bottling, the, the cylinder that you have to put all that stuff. All that prices go down. The control is in one place. As long as you manage the lines properly, it will be great. Mumbai has had it for many years. Some portions of Mumbai do get their, uh, their gas connection just like a pipe. There's a meter. Just like you consume water or electricity, you also consume gas. So this is what India is trying to do. Once it starts putting them down in some of the bigger cities, you will start seeing the overheads come down dramatically. Everywhere, they are squeezing out the inefficiencies. And, and that is something that we have to admit that we have to tip our hat to the government. Modi government has been trying to find out every place, wherever there is inefficiencies, let's go take a you know hammer to it and try to fix that thing. Thank you very much, Sridharji. We'll be back again on Saturday. And uh, we are going to do it two times a week. We really need your support, viewers. We are we are there where we we are expecting twenty five thousand views per episode. You know, Sridhar Ji has spent hours trying to put together this data because a lot of research goes into it, and we are still crossing barely ten to twelve thousand mark. We really need to up that thing. Please share this thing to your friends and viewers, and also follow us on P Gurus One, Sri Ayer One, and S Chityala. Twitter is the best way to understand where things are happening. When we don't have daily DGI, we are having a lot of stories coming out. Sridharji also puts out a lot of stories. Do follow us on Twitter. Sridharji, Namaskar, and we'll see you on uh, Saturday, sir. Namaskar, and have a wonderful evening, a wonderful day.